December 16, 1944, early morning near Monschko, Germany. The frozen ground shook as another wave of American artillery tore across the sky, but this time something was different. Terrifyingly, impossibly different. The shells weren't striking dirt or trees. They were exploding in the air, high above the advancing German lines, raining down lethal steel fragments that no foxhole could shield against. Among the men of the 326th Volksgrenadier Division pressing against the 38th Cavalry Squadron's defences, veterans hardened by years on the Eastern Front suddenly faced a kind of firepower they had never imagined. Gone were the predictable impacts, the safe zones, the protection of trenches. This was death from above, delivered with unearthly precision. At that moment, Colonel Oscar Alfred Axelson of the 406th Artillery Group had just taken one of the most consequential unauthorized actions of the Battle of the Bulge. Without approval, against strict orders, he commanded his batteries to load their most closely guarded secret, the proximity fuse. Inside each of these shells was a miniature radar device capable of sensing its distance from a target and detonating at the perfect height. With this invention, artillery lethality increased fiftyfold. In the frozen Ardennes, the very mathematics of death had been rewritten. The Germans had just encountered a weapon so revolutionary it would reshape not only this battle, but the very nature of modern warfare. The storm had begun. Operation Wacht am Rhein opened with staggering force. Hitler's last great gamble unleashed 200,000 men, 1,000 tanks, and nearly 2,000 artillery pieces hidden in the fog of the Ardennes. The F.U. Herr promised his generals this offensive would split the Allied armies, seize Antwerp, and reverse the course of a war sliding toward inevitable defeat. At 05.30 on December 16, German guns opened fire one 600 rounds per minute across an 85-mile front. The Americans were caught completely off guard. Intelligence had failed. The build-up went unseen, and the front was manned largely by green replacements or wary veterans sent to this quiet sector to rest. At Monshaw, Colonel Axelson faced an impossible choice. The 38th Cavalry Squadron, a light reconnaissance force, was being crushed by overwhelming German strength. Standard artillery fire wasn't enough. In desperation, Axelson gave the order use the proximity fuses. It was a gamble that could end in court-martial, but obedience meant certain defeat. The result was immediate. German troops, advancing in classic assault formations, were suddenly torn apart by airbursts detonating 30 to 50 feet overhead. Each explosion cast a deadly cone of fragments over a massive area. Soldiers who had once survived artillery barrages by clinging to foxholes or ducking behind trees found no refuge. This was the secret science of destruction. The proximity fuse embodied American science and industry at their peak. Unlike standard shells requiring impact or unreliable timers, these carried self-contained radars, no larger than a coffee can. Inside each were 130 components, including four or five miniature vacuum tubes, engineered to endure the crushing 20,000 G forces of firing. At ignition, the shock shattered a small glass ampule, activating a chemical battery to power the radar through flight. The design came from Dr. Merl Tuve at Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, an effort rivaling the Manhattan Project in secrecy and scale. Disguised as a used car lot in Silver Spring, Maryland, the lab employed 3% of all American physicists at its peak. Security was absolute. Workers couldn't even speak to their families about their work. Each fuse bore a unique serial number, tracked as carefully as an atomic bomb component. The technical challenges were immense. Radio tubes for living rooms had to be reinvented to survive extreme acceleration, rapid spin, rain, snow and bitter cold. The breakthrough was miniaturization. Dr. James Van Allen created tubes no bigger than pencil erasers, yet fully functional. By late 1944, American factories were producing 40 zalos and fuses per day. Over a hundred companies joined the effort, from RCA and General Electric to Sylvania and Crossley. The cost reached one billion, second only to the Manhattan Project. Axelson's gamble sparked a command crisis. The fuse was restricted to anti-aircraft defense, lest a captured sample reveal its secrets. Yet at Monshaw, its power was undeniable. The German assault collapsed under its fury. Reports reached Eisenhower within days. On December 19th, he requested full release of the weapon. By the 21st, all restrictions were lifted. Proximity fuses were unleashed across the bulge. American logistics moved swiftly. The 463rd Parachute Field Artillery Battalion at Bastogne received theirs just as the German ring closed. The 420th Armoured Field Artillery Battalion deployed them with M7 priests defending the Northwest Sector. The 969th Field Artillery Battalion, an African-American unit under Lieutenant Colonel Hubert D. Barnes, fired them to devastating effect south of town. 
Every unit reached the same conclusion. Proximity fuses turned artillery from a support arm into a war, winning weapon. Forward observers no longer needed painstaking corrections. The shells found their own altitude. Accuracy became less critical, destruction more certain. Bastong became their proving ground. The one her first airborne, encircled and outnumbered, held the crossroads with the four 63rd 75 Buenos howitzers firing thousands of rounds. Not all carried proximity fuses, but those that did shredded entire German platoons in seconds. On December 22nd, the day of General Mequilif's legendary, nuts. Reply, German infantry advancing over the snow were scythed down by airbursts with surgical precision. The 969th Battalion added its thunder. Their one FIFIB of howitzers rained steel from above creating a defensive wall no German attack could breach. Survivors spoke of units disintegrating before contact, men breaking and running from the incomprehensible storm. The carnage reached its peak along the Sauer River, December 25-26. A German battalion, cloaked in darkness and fog, tried to cross the frozen waterway. General George S. Patton himself watched as American gunners unleashed proximity fuses. What followed would be etched into his memoirs, War as I Knew It. The result was annihilation. As the first waves of Germans reached the far bank, the sky erupted. Shells burst high overhead, showering the river with deadly fragments. Within minutes, the frozen surface was littered with shattered bodies, weapons and broken gear. Survivors described the water turning red beneath the ice. Entire companies vanished in the storm. Patton, watching from the command post, understood immediately what he was witnessing artillery had been reborn. The proximity fuse had transformed the battlefield giving American gunners the ability to cut down massed infantry in the open as if they were standing on a rifle range. What had once required overwhelming numbers of guns and endless ammunition could now be achieved with terrifying efficiency. By the end of December, the weapon had become a decisive factor across the Ardennes. From Bastogne's defenders to Patton's advancing Third Army, artillery units reported the same effect German attacks that had once seemed unstoppable simply collapsed under airburst fire. In many cases, the psychological impact was just as devastating as the physical. Troops who had survived countless barrages on the Eastern Front broke and ran under this new kind of bombardment. Captured German reports spoke of death from the sky, describing shells that seemed to seek men out wherever they hid. One officer wrote that his soldiers no longer believed foxholes offered protection, that morale was broken by invisible fire. For the Allies, the proximity fuse represented not only a technological triumph, but also a strategic turning point. It gave American units holding thin defensive lines the means to resist vastly superior numbers. It bought time for reinforcements to arrive, for supply lines to stabilize, for the counteroffensive to take shape. By January 1945, as the German drive stalled and the Ardennes began to freeze into silence, the secret was fully in the open. Eisenhower himself would later call the proximity fuse one of the most decisive developments of the war. Churchill went further, declaring it, second only to the atomic bomb, in its impact on the outcome. Yet at the moment of its first use, on that bitter December morning outside Monschau, none of this was certain. Colonel Axelson could not have known that his unauthorized decision would change the course of the battle, perhaps even the war itself. All he knew was that his men were outnumbered, the enemy was advancing, and conventional fire was failing, so he gambled, loaded the shells, broke the rules, and in doing so, unleashed a revolution in warfare.